Hey everybody, this is Shashi here. Um, we're having a bit of a technical issues at the backstage there with Pavan. Uh, we're gonna sort that out very soon. Um, I thought, let me just quickly come in and say hello to you guys so that you know we're still on. Um, so yes, thank you so much for coming. Pavan's gonna come and join us in about a couple of minutes. I think it's almost there. Um, so, you know, Drip Startup House, we keep uh, doing these sessions, especially after COVID, we've been doing a lot of these sessions um, necessarily because uh, this is our way of trying to support our community, um, try to sort of uh, give them access to people who have some experience and know or rather have some experience of being in situations like these in the past. Uh, I mean, though this is not the situation anybody has been in the past, but similar such situations at least to try and get as many perspectives as possible from people, uh, different kinds of people that we all could benefit from as a community. So um, that's the whole intent uh, behind uh, hosting these sessions for you all. Um, for those uh, of you who don't know what Dripper Startup House is, uh, Dripper Startup House is a network of global network of entrepreneurial uh, communities and physical spaces. We are like, um, you know, startup residencies that sort of, you know, uh, comes together in different spaces, in different countries uh, with the ecosystem that the local com countries and cities have to offer. So we operate in about nine different uh, countries all around the world. Um, we have, you know, in Asia, we're in Bangalore, we're in Singapore, we're in Yangon, in Burma, we have a soft sort of, a, you know, program going on in Hong Kong. Uh, we have a new space that we opened up in Manila in the Philippines. Um, and then, you know, we also have two spaces in Europe, which is one in Lisbon in Portugal. The other one is in Tallinn in Estonia. And the um, on, in the US, we have a new space that's come up and waiting to be opened and launched in Austin. Um, it was actually sort of uh, time to be uh, launched during uh, South by Southwest, but now South by Southwest got, got cancelled and then hence our launch got cancelled. So, you know, a lot of things have changed for all of us and I'm sure it's not only us. So um, that's the story of Draper Startup House. Um, we should be able to get Pavan in any time. Uh, sorry for this delay. Uh, there's been a small bit of a, a browser issue. We're trying to sort that out for him. Yeah, so just stay tight. If you have any questions, you can shoot me and I can try and answer those questions in the meantime. There is a chat window. Um, there's a question window there. You can just come in and say hello and leave any questions if you have in the meantime, till Pawan comes. Okay, question. Hi, Shashi. What are the main learning from lockdown? The main learning from lockdown uh, so far has been that um, uh, life knows a lot more than what you know about life. In general, I think it's a very high level spiritual sort of a statement. But business wise, um, you know, this is, I keep sort of, ah, there he is. You can hear, sir. Apologies, guys. That happens. Sincere uh -huh. apologies for the technical snafu. <laughs> but I'm here. Yeah, yeah, that's what counts. That's what counts. <laughs> so here he is. I'm going to just straight dive in and I'm going to sort of, I'm not going to even waste a minute because I want to hear everything possible from him and uh, get as much as we can out of him in the last, next one hour, one and a half hours, depending on how much time he has. Just a quick introduction. Um, Pawan's a, a brilliant academic. Uh, he's an amazing researcher. He's, he's done so many different things in his life. He comes from Hyderabad. He loves his biryani. He has beautiful... <laughs> he's traveled around the world. He's taught in different places. Um, the most important thing is that uh, I really credit a lot of where I am personally 
for all the time that I spent with him, probably I was one of the students who paid nothing, but got the most <laughs> things that he had to teach. So, um, you know, Pavan, I cannot stop thinking about those evenings that, you know, I had the privilege of sitting and sharing a drink and talking about, I mean, you were talking about things and I was 20 something and I have not even heard those things in my life before. And that sort of set me off in a direction in life, which has brought me to where I am, which is about entrepreneurship and understanding people and behavior and, and economics and design and so on and so forth. I'm not an academic. Um, I haven't sort of professionally gotten trained in these areas, but I think I have learned a lot of these things by doing observing. Uh, that's probably one of the things that I did. I observed you when you were talking a lot of things uh, during those days. So, Alan, thank you so much for taking the time thank and coming and joining us. Thank uh, you. You know, Pawan now is, is, is working as a director um, of the Center for Social and Behavioral Change. Pawan, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, it is a lot of work. Um, but first of all, Shashi, I mean, I'm most grateful to you guys for uh, putting this together. And at the very outset, uh, my sincere apologies for the slight delay. Um, so Shashi, I mean, uh, the, the benefits have been mutual. It's not just one way. As I mentioned a little earlier, mentorship is always uh, reciprocal. In as much as I have been your mentor, you have been my mentor too. I, I always told my teachers, uh, my, my students, that they, have, that, they are, uh, that they have been some of my best teachers. So I, I do believe that we co-evolved. We met at a very opportune time in the late 90s uh, at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, where Shashi was a, a young entrepreneur working with a firm that we were incubating out of IIM Bangalore at the NS Raghavan Center. And he was impressionable. He was curious. He was absolutely brilliant. I was stupid. And, <laughs> and, and, but, uh, but above all, he was humble. And, and, and that's what makes him um, a, a truly special friend who came into my life and who shaped it in, in no small measure. Thank you, Shashi, for having me. It's a, it, it's a great pl pleasure to be here uh, in conversations with you. Yes, Thank CSBC. You. Yeah, uh, CSBC is a lot of work. <laughs> It does sound like Pavan, you know, uh, they've unfortunately sort of been around everywhere in the world and have not been able to catch up uh, and keep a tab on what we've been doing in the last five years. Uh, what have you been up to in the last five years? Where all have you been? What all have, what all have you been working on? So the last five years, um, five years ago, I was at the uh, Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. I was a professor there. I had spent a couple of years there and uh, I had come back from the US, I was working in Boston, I was, I was at Harvard University and I came back. Um, and then I, uh, you know, I was trying to set up a, a behavioral lab in India, the first behavioral lab. Uh, I was trying to create a job for myself in some sense because my IAM job wasn't giving me what I wanted. And then I said, hell, I mean, you know, I'm going to put all the pieces together and then start this lab. And that's when uh, I approached Oxford, which, which is uh, where I did my doctoral work. And uh, they said, we'll put our name on what you do in India and let's start this behavioral lab in India. So that's when uh, I, I literally opened up uh, the map of India and said, okay, Ahmedabad has been a fairly, <clears throat> uh, shall we say, hot experience given uh, the weather. Let, let me try and find a, a comfortable place. And that's when I discovered Pune and that's where I, that's where I went and I approached uh, these incredible investment bankers out of Mumbai who funded me and then I started my lab and I created a space where I could do research that I really enjoyed. And that's so, so that's, that's what I've been doing. And then uh, about a year ago, I was approached by an outstanding uh, uh, entrepreneur himself. His name is Pramod Sinha. He's, uh, you know, 200 years from now, I, I tell people he's, he's the guy who's going to be remembered for revolutionizing Indian education. He started the Indian School of Business and he started Ashoka University. He approached me and he said, you know, uh, BMGF has uh, started this national level platform, uh, a behavioral thing. Would you come and head it? Um, and that's when I, uh, I also re discovered an, uh, an old friend and a former student of mine, Pooja Haldia. And uh, I said, let, let me go and work with them. And that's when I decided to, you know, 
uh, moved to Delhi and, uh, and I've been in Delhi over the past six or seven months now. So essentially, I'm a researcher. I, I do empirical work and mm -hmm. I try to understand human behavior and I try and see how that can be applied in solving real world concrete problems. What is behavioral economics, right? So, uh, you know, what's so special about it and why, why is it necessary and especially how do you sort of see that playing in, in policies uh, in the way, you know, a lot of things that is going on, especially in an Indian context here, for example. How does yeah. it work? How does, how does your, uh, you know, uh, your organization play a role in that? So, so behavioral economics is a, uh, is a, a new and an emergent area. Uh, it, it sort of uh, brushed away the cobwebs of traditional neoclassical economics. Economics was dominated by uh, essentially mathematicians who believed that human beings are automatons. Human beings are hyper-rational entities. Human beings are like the spokes of uh, Star Trek, right? who always systematically make uh, uh, rational decisions, very self-serving decisions and so on. Uh, and, and they got it really wrong. They got it really, really wrong. And that's when a couple of psychologists entered the field and said, hey, listen, uh, you, you economists don't know how human beings really work, really think. And we need to go out into the field and, and actually study how they make decisions, how they think. And they said, and, and they came to this rather uh, very interesting conclusion that human beings are not uh, rational all the time. They are capable of rationality. Uh, they're capable of making calculations and doing the right things, but they can also be systematically irrational. And by irrational, one doesn't mean uh, sporadic, but systematically irrational. And that's the key sort of uh, intuition that one needs to understand. So behavioral science, behavioral economics is the mapping of human irrationality, how people actually behave in the real world. And uh, what they, and, 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 and we can use this. Uh, to basically change behavior to accomplish the ends that we require in society. So it's a sort of a more holistic understanding of human behavior, uh, which accommodates the sort of the dual abilities of the human mind. On one side, the rational side, as well as the sort of the irrational side. That's, that's the sort of the core of behavioral economics. And it's, a, it's an exciting field. It's an exciting field because it approximates closer to human behavior and therefore we are able to better predict how people behave and use that knowledge to get people to do the things that are potentially useful uh, not only to themselves but to society at large so is it fair to sort of say that instead of i'm just sort of sort of you know really dumb it down for my understanding uh, is mm -hmm. that it's better to understand why people break let's say for example in, in indian context the traffic uh, a, a rule or a regulation than to impose heavy fines after they break it. That's right. That's awesome. so, so, yeah, so, so, okay, this is, this is a great example. Uh, you're, you're now treading into uh, the tricky aspects of human beings. So a lot of people, uh, what they essentially try to do is try to maximize their returns. They want to shorten the time that they want to spend in traffic and get to their destination. And in doing so, they don't follow the rules. And in breaking the rules, what they don't realize is that everybody else is doing essentially the same. And when everybody else breaks the rules, that leads to a sort of an equilibrium which is not good for everybody. Right? So there are two ways of changing this behavior. One is using formal institutions. You get the government to work harder or the police there to monitor the behavior of people driving on the road and say, hey, you know, we're going to fine you for behaving badly. That's one way of doing it. But that's a costly uh, thing. Why? Because it involves huge resources that need to be expended by the government. You don't find police sufficiently on Indian roads. Actually, India is one of the places in this world which has a per capita police density, which is one of the lowest. So because they don't have enough police, people continue doing behaving badly. Now, there's an alternate way of, uh, <clears throat> of getting people to behave properly. And and I'm reminded of this wonderful example uh, from Mumbai traffic. They experimented with a, a, a terrific, terrific intervention. They had these red lights, right? And you would stop there at the red light. And, you know, we Indians, you know, we tend to honk our 
uh, haunts a lot and, and that adds tremendously to sound pollution. And so, you know, the, the Mumbai police said, okay, let's do one thing. The louder the honking or the more the honking, the volume of honking increases, we'll increase the time that they spend at the red light. Wow. Right? So they, they basically created a little instrument which captured the amount of sound that is being produced and continued extending the light, red light, in proportion to the amount of honking. Now, and this, and this of course, was given back as information to the people who were uh, 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 at the red light, right? Now, what does this do? Every time you honk now, you know that it's going to cost you. You're, you're costing yourself in some sense. And, this, and they found and they discovered that it actually reduced the amount of honking and, uh, and, 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 and you know, it reduced the, the level of sound pollution. So this is a non-governmental, non-state mechanism where you get people to do what is actually optimal for themselves. And that is the sort of the essence of behavior, uh, the application of behavioral uh, insights to uh, getting people to do, do what is good for them. Nice. So, you know, Pawan, interestingly, I just want to sort of draw a parallel to what is going on in the world today, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously in behavioral economics, you have these concepts of nudges. That's right. Um, are we in some sort of a universal nudge situation right now? Have you forced to sort of, you know, in their behavior. No, that's a great question. So, is this some kind of a cosmic nudge to get yeah. us to do the things that we sh uh, that we should be doing and not do the things uh, that we're not doing? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. So, but but nudging is an important concept in behavioral economics. Uh, I don't know if there is a cosmic nudge. Um, <laughs> um, that that would be a sort of a uh, that would be a metaphysical exactly. speculation. Uh, yeah. but, but having said that. Uh, the 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 pandemic has made us come to terms with some really key things about human behavior about the interconnectedness of human beings and that we can't be pursuing uh private benefits in isolation in some sense uh in 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 creating rivalrous consumption of resources and entitlements we may actually be diminishing our own entitlements and our own health and our own uh, rights in some measure. So the interconnectedness uh, uh, is one of the key sort of uh, uh, lessons that we are trying to uh, draw from our current experience. Um, but but uh, nudging at a, at a more sort of prosaic level, uh, one of my favorite examples of nudging is this uh, experiment that they ran in uh, the airport, the toilets in Shifal Airport. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, this example, but it's a it's sort of an iconic example of how nudges are used. So men would go to urinals, and they would uh, urinate all over the damn place, right? Making a mess, as men are supposed to. <laughs> and, and, and so, and then you know, cleaning would require, uh, you know, expense. It, it, you know, you need to spend more water and so on. So what did they do? They, they painted a little fly inside the toilet, right? At a spot where if one were to urinate on that spot, it would minimize the amount of spillage, right? I mean, I could, I could send you some pictures of this. Uh, and, 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 and as it turns out, when they painted this fly, it, it provoked the instinct of men to aim and take and shoot. It's, it's perhaps a primal thing. And that's exactly what they did. And it reduced the amount of uh, pissing on the sides as it were, right? So it's sort of a non-governmental procedure. It's a non-state procedure to get people to do what is actually in the interest of society and, and, and indirectly to their own selves. Yeah, yeah so, I've seen some of these you know, examples, especially when you're flying in from wherever Europe or the US and if you're transiting in Dubai, yeah, and you're moving more towards the terminals to you know, the flies or to Asia, towards India, the toilets have been designed differently. The kind That's of right. you know, things that you see in there are different compared to the ones that fly to the West. Yes. Um, no, there's, there's another wonderful intervention that I should tell you about. They basically shortened the length of the separators between toilets. In other words, forcing people to go closer to the toilet bowl to <laughs> urinate. That also reduces spillage in some measure. So these are sort of design interventions which produce good outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, Pavan, you know, uh, there is this whole, you know, talk about the new normal. You know, people are talking about so there's going to be some profound changes in the society. People are going to change now. This is the time, you know, I, it reminds me of the time in 1945 and just when the world came out of World War II, people yeah. started talking about this being a zero year. And a lot of things that the world has done to where we have gotten today is because of the initiatives it took at that time. Right. Uh, is, are we really going to change? Is, is there a change coming? How do you see this, especially from a behavioral point of view? Okay. So... I, I think we need to map this change. This change yeah? We need to create a map. Um, so I think the media has a propensity, a natural propensity to exaggerate, uh, exaggerate uh, ominous things, exaggerate bad things, because negative stuff sells much better than positive stuff, at least in the news media. So I think we need to take those those types of prognosis with a pinch of salt. But having said that, I classify change into two types of broad change. One is temporary and the other is permanent. <clears throat> I think people have tended to exaggerate the permanent changes. Okay. I mean, are we going to stop seeing each other or you know, will, will there be a time when we will not uh, hug each other, when we will not uh, shake hands? Uh, I'm sure we will. I'm sure that that will come back. Why? Because there are medical professionals working day and night, day in and day and night, and those vaccines will come. And uh, you know, some measure of normalcy will be restituted. I think uh, this new normal is sort of a, a, a fancy expression to sort of uh, terrorize us into uh, thinking that you know our life has changed in in a, in, a, in a very fundamental way. Uh, uh, so, so there are permanent changes and there are temporary changes, right? And I think we have tended to exaggerate the permanent changes, at least for some people. There are very serious permanent changes for, uh, for uh, the marginalized, right? Because people have lost their jobs, people are dying. There's no doubt about that, right? So you've got to, you've got to uh, map this division between temporary and permanent changes across different sections of society. Uh, among the temporary changes, uh, we say, yes, we certainly have to practice social distancing for a, a, a temporary period of time and so on. Uh, but within the sphere of permanent changes, some of the things uh, are useful perhaps to us as a society. And some of them, in, in other words, some of them are benign permanent changes. And some of them are possibly potentially dangerous permanent changes. Let's try and look at both these types. The benign permanent changes, for instance, are likely to be in the spheres of uh, working at a distance, for instance. Working at a distance has always been recognized as perhaps a, a more efficient way of doing things. Working, working at a distance in not every situation, but working at a distance, at least in some spheres, is much more efficient. So that is likely to change. And I think this is going to catapult us more in the direction of being able to uh, contribute our inputs, factors of production to a, a, to a firm or a, to a company in a more efficient manner. But the more sort of worrying potential changes that can come up in society are linked to uh, our society, uh, our society's access to justice, for instance. Mm -hmm. what, happens to, what happens to the judiciary, right? I mean, during this temporary period, we are already witnessing a dilution of our access to justice. Courts are not working. I mean, if, if the state is likely to <clears throat> infringe upon our personal rights, do we have the same level of access to the courts? And if we actually get used to the idea that we have lesser access to justice, then that is a slippery slope towards uh, autocracy, right? I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to happen here, but that's a possibility. And not merely here in India, but the world over, right? That's, that's one. Uh, and this is something that Paul Krugman has written about in New York Times recently as well, bemoaning how that slippery slope may have already begun in the United States. Take for, you know, my center, you know, my colleague Pooja does outstanding work on, <clears throat> on privacy. And we, we've been doing a lot of work on privacy. Uh, the, 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 the dilution of privacy, for instance, could potentially lead us to a, 
uh, a more Orwellian world, you know, the 1984 book, right, which talks about Big Brother watching you and so on. Right now, Big Brother needs to watch you in your own self-interest because they can better trace people who have the disease and help us avoid uh, people who have the disease and get infected and so on. But what if this sort of slips away into a situation where now Big Brother uses that information to our detriment down the road? And that is the, and that, and that is the sort of the possibility that I think we need to guard ourselves. So some of the changes are going to be extremely useful. I mean, you know, I think educational institutions are going to become a lot more efficient. Uh, working from home in certain for certain kinds of work is going to get better and so on. Uh, but we need to certainly guard ourselves against more fundamental structural changes in the political economy of the country or, or for that matter, the world. Yeah. I guess I want to go back and, and, and you know take a little more uh, take a dig a little more into the privacy that you talked about yeah is all yeah. this sort of you know thought that's running around which is uh, you know we've got the uh, you know we're just coming out of the data privacy act uh, we're coming out of all the situations in you know in social media companies and these companies controlling a lot of the data mm -hmm. and there was a debate about breaking them and so you know, sort of getting government control and things like that mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a that's a debate on one one end, and then there's another debate here by saying that the government now you know there was a lot of resistance in the public uh, sector uh, for government for government intervention, right? So they didn't want governments to intervene uh, as much in business. They always used to say that the business of the government is not its business, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. now we are all running to the government for a bailout. We are all depending on the government for help and support. Mm -hmm. It obviously is all, does all, it also means that government has the uh, has the power now to sort of arm twist and move in these directions. How do you sort of prevent that from really happening? Because we are really helpless as a society and also as businesses today, isn't it? So, so the government, at, so there's a premise one. The premise one is private entities, private companies violate your privacy. They, they get you to submit a lot of information uh, and, and, and they can use it irresponsibly. They can sell stuff to you that you don't want to buy. They can reduce uh, consumer welfare progressively over a period of time. But, but one of the sort of redeeming features of the private sector uh, intruding upon your privacy is that there is sufficient competition within the private sector to produce some measure of accountability. Now, the government is expected to provide us some degree of regulatory protection against the private sector <clears throat> intruding on our privacy. But the danger lies in the government itself becoming predatory. Right? And, and, there's, no, and there's no recourse uh, to justice, especially when you have a, a legal system that is uh, sufficiently compromised. Right? Yeah. So for the government to function as a, as a vibrant democracy, you need to have that systematic gap between the executive, the legislative body, and the judiciary on a continuous basis. And if the autonomy of the judiciary is compromised, then a lot of these rights, including the rights to privacy, will start getting whittled away. And that's something that we need to think about. Absolutely. So, Pavan, you know, there is this whole, obviously, exaggeration, or, or rather the reality of a lot of things going digital. There have been these sort of discussions around why do we need universities like, say, for example, uh, you yeah. know, campus like Harvard's and Stanford's, which used yeah. to be so great, such great institutions in such big size and numbers, and everybody used to run to it by paying a lot of money. Yeah. How do you see education changing going forward? Do we see a lot of online universities like Harvard and Stanford popping up? Absolutely. Well, uh, Harvard and Stanford have a lot of money. They might be able to withstand the blow. But this is a great question, Shashi. Uh, I do think that universities, particularly uh, universities by and large, have become bloated. They've become inefficient, right? Um, take, for instance, a standard undergraduate uh, school in, in the US. They charge anywhere between fifty and $60,000, right? for a curriculum that can be very easily uh, deployed using online means. MOOCs are phenomenal. I mean, they have criticized, I mean, one of the biggest 
uh, proponents of, uh, of this revolution has been Clayton Christensen. And you know, the irony is that he died a, 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 about a year ago, I think. And he was talking about how MOOCs are go the MOOC revolution is going to happen and private universities are going to start contracting. I think the pandemic is now going to hasten that process because people are going, I mean, people are going to lose jobs now due to the economic downturn and people will not be able to afford these high fees to send their kids to college. Why is it that I can't go into Coursera or I can go into Harappa? We have a, you know, a, an outstanding company within India now and get phenomenally good teachers to teach us. So this move is a move towards the democratization of education, which we have been, which has been missing in this country for forever. You know, education was always treated as the private property of a few communities, right? People, some people were not entitled to an education. That's our right? system. Yeah, essentially, right? Now, this is a revolution. Now I can, anybody, I mean, anybody who has a basic internet connection can get online and you know, uh, and, and enroll for Scott Page's amazing course on model thinking from the University of Michigan. They can learn linear algebra from Gilbert Strang at MIT, right? I don't need to. I don't need to go to an IIM Bangalore or an IIM Ahmedabad anymore. I mean, back in the day in, in 2000 when we when we were hanging out uh, in at IIM Bangalore, I came up with this crazy idea. I don't know if you remember this. I suggested to the IIM Bangalore uh, faculty, why don't we try and put a camera, a video recorder in a, in a classroom and make this material accessible to, you know, back in the day, make CDs and then distribute them around the country. And, uh, you know, they basically shouted me down. They said, you know, this is going to dilute the brand equity of IIM Bangalore. I mean, we are cat's whiskers in this world. That was stupid. Like literally a couple of years, Literally around that time, MIT came up with open course fair. An institution like MIT came up with the idea that we need to democratize, we need to make accessible the great stuff that we do in this university to the world outside. And so I think the, I think the pandemic is going to help us. So that's one of the benign, hopefully permanent changes that I think we will witness in our lifetime. Yeah. And so I'm still the more time. Sorry. I'm, I'm reminded of a sort of a quote that I read recently that said, decades go by where nothing's happened. And there are sometimes in a week, a decades happen. A decade That's happens. Right. That's right? right. That's right. We are in a situation where everything is accelerated. All That's of these right. things have been at the fringes. And now people are changing behaviors in such high rapid pace. And they're forced That's into right. environments and they're learning, they're adapting governments, consumers, everybody. That's right. I just want to switch at this stage from, I want to bring behavior and entrepreneurship sort of together and see what kind of opportunities that comes out of these things. Mm -hmm. If you take, say, for example, education, right? What do you think? One or two things that you think as a bullet point, you should, you know, you should, you, should, you, you want to tell people to start consider thinking in the direction or, or opportunities. So I think, I think the world of education has tremendous opportunities. I mean, I've been, you know, I have two small kids now. And I'm trying to see how I can create a sort of an online classroom for them during this pandemic. And I go through, you know, the standard uh, companies that are in some terrific company, you know, Baiju's and so on. They need to start innovating around how people actually engage with a teacher. When I'm sitting with a, with a teacher, I have a blackboard, right? It's a one-to-one -one conversation. It's a didactic process. It's a, it's a two-way process. There's got to be a, a, a technological solution which affords a two-way transmission of information rather than running videos for kids, right? So is, is it possible to, it might be, it, it might, I mean, scalability may be a problem, but that could be one potential innovation, right? So I, I think the opportunities are tremendous uh, uh, within the world of education. Now, I want to be able to get the curricular inputs for my kids online and then send my kids to the local government school and not these, these stupid posh schools because I want my kids to socialize with, uh, with the real world in some sense. And that, for, to me, is far better education 
than what they might get in a posh school, right? Where you know they become a, a, a member of a sort of a, where, where elitism is reproduced in some sense. Uh, so, I, so if curriculum can be pushed online and schools become micro campuses of social engagement, which is also an integral part of education, then the segregation of these two might be a, 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 a very cool kind of a revolution to actually promote. And I think it's an opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. I was, I was sitting down with, uh, you know, with an op- entrepreneur who runs a, a pretty fairly large size micro mobility startup out of Bangalore, and I was talking to them. Um, interestingly, they're so bullish right now that pe- they're, they're sort of predicting people will stop taking public transport. People will want hyper personal micro mobility solutions which they can wrap it wrap it up put it in the you know luggage and probably go back into their offices or into their homes so that's the kind of moonshot sort of you know prediction people are doing in the industry and in the society right now especially in the entrepreneurial world do you think you know this is going to happen for uh, you know uh, banking industries is going to happen for food it's going to happen for how, where, what kind of behavioral changes are we going to see in these in these everyday sort of interactions that we have with people in the society? That's a very difficult question. I mean, it's a it's a it's a wide sweeping question, right? Banking or, or manufacturing, etc. Let Let's try and navigate through your question in a in a in a systematic manner. <clears throat> what has been a traditional factory or a business? A traditional factory, for instance, has been a place where you bring human capital in approximate relationship with uh, capital assets. You know, you have machines and so on and so forth. Uh, You know, if you were to think about it from the point of view of what Coase said about a firm, it facilitates coordination, it reduces transaction costs, and it uh, allows us to peg peg into economies of scale and you can actually produce a lot more. That's going to be revolutionized in one fundamental way and that is robotics. I mean, you don't need human beings to go into those spaces to actually uh, facilitate that coordinated sequencing that you require to uh, animate these uh, economies of scale, right? Let's, Let's imagine that that's going to happen. But this does not stop the requirement of people coming together, right? There are two reasons why people can come together. People can come together to exchange information that can be exchanged online. And that would be inefficient. I mean, I I don't need to catch an airplane to go to Boston to say the things that I can say online. I mean, you're in Germany now and I'm in India and we're having a fairly seamless conversation here. However, there's a certain other type of a conversation which becomes very, very difficult to manage uh, using an online platform. And this kind of an information, let's call it tacit information. It's, it's information that, uh, uh, that is produced uh, through nonverbal cues. I mean, when, I, when I'm sitting with you in person and having a glass of wine, I can see your microfacial expressions. I can see your mood. I can sense your mood much better. And that creates... A, a far more powerful exchange of information which can lead to a creative outcome. So for collaborative, creative kinds of production, you still need that human interaction. But for administrative exchange of information, you don't need that. That can be hived off into this online space, right? But does it, I mean, does it stop us from uh, will it stop us from meeting each other? I think meeting each other is an inessential aspect of our existence. And whether whether it be for dating, or uh, you know finding a partner in a bar, or for uh, uh, co-writing a song, right? Absolutely. We need to be in the presence of each other. Absolutely. Uh, so we need to divide the world into these two, make one more efficient, and preserve the necessity to remain in touch in person in real space for certain other things. Absolutely. Um, guys, the ones who are listening, they're going to start taking questions in a couple of minutes. I've got one last question for Pavan. And after that, I'm going to jump into questions. So 
please keep sending those questions. You have a question sort of a tab on your right hand side of the screen. Just keep going and throwing questions. And we're going to pick from there. Pavan, I want to sort of now switch to a bit of a behavior of leaders during these times, right? The, 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 behavior, the behavior of leadership in general, in societies and companies, as entrepreneurs, as organizations. I know you've had some exposure in organizational behavior. You know, you've done a lot of work in different spaces. Uh, what sort of behavior should a leader go through right now? Right? What sort of qualities should a leader have right now in handling these kind of crises? Great question. Great, great, uh, great line of thinking, Shashi. Uh, I think good. Uh, I think leaders should be much more compassionate now. This is a time to be very compassionate. There are a lot of people out there hurting. I mean, we are in a relatively more privileged position sitting in air conditioned rooms and so on. There's a, a bunch of uh, you know migrant laborers walking back home and so on. Let's not even talk about those because that would be uh, that would be hypocritical in, in some sense. So let's not talk about. That. But even with when you talk about leaders within organizations in the formal sector, they need to understand that people are undergoing a lot of stress. There's a lot of cognitive load on, uh, on, on, on individuals, right? What do you mean by cognitive load? It's a behavioral concept. It, it just tells us that the human brain is a, has finite processing capacity. Hmm? And when you open multiple tabs on your browser dedicated to thinking about where your next meal is going to come into, the tab that is required to make rational decisions slows down, right? So there's a tremendous amount of uh, load on, on, on the brain. And this is the time that people are susceptible to making those behavioral mistakes. They're susceptible to uh, miscalculating or overestimating probabilities or engaging in knee-jerk reactions. And this is the time that leaders of organizations need to be compassionate and accommodate, uh, uh, and accommodate these factors, right? They need to allow their employees uh, they need to give, be given that human space, and that's and, and and that's very very important. And if they were to do that, I'm pretty damn sure that these employees would come back and uh, and, and 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 work in a far more committed manner than they would otherwise. Absolutely. Uh, so these are not assets; these are human beings at the end of the day. True. And we we can't lose compassion in, in the scheme of things. Yeah, you know, I sort of want to also say that. This, we always have these societies love authority, right? Society loves the concept of leadership. Society always tries to sort of look up to somebody for answers. Right. Uh, while we talk about cognitive overload, uh, it's also you know the, our leaders are humans too. In fact, they must be going through the similar kind of you know situations themselves. So, I think in some sense. Uh, Maybe we need to sort of democratize authority in the society in some sense by saying that, you know, everybody has to start behaving as you earlier talked about, which is, you know, behave. If you behave, what is good for you? It's good for the society in, 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 in return. So no, I, I, agree. I agree. I've seen news items of uh, politicians uh, ignoring, you know, the, the norm of social distancing that is required now. I mean, they're not setting good examples in, no. in, in behaving in such a manner. Right? And ostentatious weddings, which has been a, a, a terrible thing, I think. I mean, this is not a time to do that. This is a time for frugality. It's a time to set a, an example. But there's something else that leaders can do to democratize the process of decision making within uh, the, their own governance structures. And that is to, I, I think leaders need to start bringing in people who can, uh, in an institutional ma manner, criticize the decisions that they take. Leaders need people who can challenge them, and they need to make friends with those people, right? And keep them within their close circles. Leaders need to distance the people who are yes men, basically. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's so. That's a that's an an important structural adjustment that good leaders can, I think, uh, secure leaders can actually afford to do. Absolutely, and I think uh, 
you know, the whole thing we've been watching, especially waiting for someone in the government or someone in WHO to come and tell us wear a mask. Uh, for me, that's just such a no-brainer. Wearing a mask, we don't need authorities to come in and telling you you should wear a mask. People should that's just right. do it themselves. That's right. That's right. That's right. What is the what is it that what what is it that in a behavioral world you see that people are so dependent on somebody telling you what to do? Why do people behave like that? Well, I think it's a form of mental laziness, isn't it? Okay. You don't want to think about uh, decisions. I mean, there's this wonderful experiment <laughs> of uh, that has been written about. If you were to walk into a supermarket and you were to be given a choice of a large number of uh, jams that you that you could buy the likelihood of you buying a jam and getting out of the supermarket is lesser than when there are fewer jams given uh, 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 as an offering on the shelves why because it imposes a lesser cognitive load on your mind when you have this huge choice it imposes a tremendous amount of cognitive load Right. So, yeah. So, where are you going? So, could you could you repeat that question again? Uh, I, I lost you somewhere there. No, that's all right. I was just basically sort of saying that people need to now start making. Yeah. Their own yeah. Decisions. yeah. So, what, so yes. So, so it's a form of mental laziness to want to depend on the leader because the leader has done all the thinking for you. Right. It's it's the herd instinct. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's that's essentially what it is. It is a form of mental laziness that you don't want to calculate your calculations on your own. You'd rather that somebody reliable do it for you and you follow it. Absolutely. So I got some questions coming in, Pawan. Right. So an interesting question. Uh, this is a question about values. I think it's it's interesting. So uh, the person has basically asked this question. Uh, Janardhan Reddy has asked this question about what are the value changes that we will see. Uh, you know, in startups, basically culture and values. I want to sort of stretch that question to a couple of other areas as well. What sort of values and cultural changes that you think we will see after this, even in in in, in capitalistic markets, in in, in democracy in general, uh, we might be able to sort of learn from that uh, into startups as well. So I think this is for the very first time uh, in 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 a long long time in the history of uh, human beings that they have come to face a situation where you cannot privately protect yourself without protecting uh, the least advantaged. You, I mean, you, you, you cannot, and it's the, the, the very nature of the pandemic challenges your sustainability, right? On the basis that it challenges everybody else's sustainability. So a solution, to this problem cannot be private. The solution to this problem is a public one. And that is a fundamental form of moral education that I think human society is uh, coming to terms with, right? So, so rich countries would not develop medicines uh, which, which were solutions to problems in tropical countries, for instance, like less developed countries. But rich countries have been equally hit by this problem. So any solution that they produce can't be just for themselves, but it has to be for everyone else. And, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure that they can protect these domains of knowledge that they produce uh, by using intellectual property anymore. Because ah. I think all the poor countries can exercise compulsory licensing and exercise eminent domain, and you know that knowledge becomes a public good. So the creation of public goods then becomes sort of the new norm. This is the new ethic. This is the new value that I think people will become more comfortable with. And that's a, and that's a, a, a tremendous, I think, shift in our uh, ethical imagination. And do you see that uh, playing out in, in, in democratic environment when you're making decisions about who you choose as leaders uh, to lead your countries uh, and what these leaders stand for? Not yet. Not yet. The reason being... Uh, these lockdowns have given temporary reprieve to the privileged. You can insulate yourself for a couple of months, whereas there's a vast section of society that can't 
protect itself, right? But how long are you going to insulate yourself? What happens after six months when your supply chains, when your vegetable vegetable vendor doesn't knock on your door anymore? What are you going to do? You'll have to come out, or you'll have to find a solution that is commonly accessible to everybody, right? So, 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 so the initial knee-jerk reaction of leadership, at least in poor countries, has been to propose lockdowns. I mean, well, I mean, at that stage, I mean. Given the circumstances, given the cognitive loads on the leadership, they did have to take this decision. I mean, ex ante, most of us would have taken the decision. But now, given our the benefit of hindsight, we are able to say maybe the lockdown has another side to it, and that is uh, not necessarily so ethical in the sense that what about all these poor people? And in the long run, that's going to come back and bite us in the back. Absolutely. Right? I got, a, I got an interesting technical question from someone called Hari Reddy. Okay. So he says, Dear Pavan, could you help me to understand neuro aspects of trust deficit in terms of consciousness? I'm highly hmm. curious to know further. I don't have I, I don't have absolutely any expertise in neuroscience. Uh, although I can talk a little about trust, uh, I, I do think that trust is going to be a, a victim of the pandemic in some measure, right? I mean, when you go out and meet people, you're going to be less trusting of whether the person is an uh, asymptomatic carrier or not. And this is not uh, trust, a, a diminution of trust in the sense that you, you, you question the person's intentions, but you might question the person's ability to detect the disease within him himself or herself. And that's where the erosion of trust is likely to happen. Right, so so there is likely to be a temporary uh, diminution of trust in society when we actually start going out after the lockdown ends. But the bigger question is, what about trust as regards the government? What about trust as regards institutions and so on? That is the bigger question, and I don't have answers to that question. Great question, I don't have the answer to. I don't have a satisfactory answer to that question. So. Pawan, now moving to the, uh, the center, right? Uh, to the Center for Social, uh, the CSBC. Um, what do you see CSBC's role going forward? Because I'm seeing that your organizations like yours are going to be playing a very, very important role in advising the you know, policies, advising the corporate governance, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, what do you think is, gonna, is on your plate? Uh, what are you looking forward to? What are the things that you are working on already? Yeah. So thanks for asking uh, that question, Shashi, because it allows me to uh, uh, say a, a little about what I think is uh, shaping out to be a terrific organization. CSBC was uh, created uh, by BMGF, by a, a very generous sort of uh, uh, contribution from BMGF, and it's housed in Ashoka University. We are Ashoka University, which is a tremendous, as I mentioned earlier, it's a tremendous institution. Uh, the main purpose of CSBC is to do empirical, empirically oriented work and inform public policy. So now one of our flagship programs uh, is, is this uh, arrangement that we have with Niti Aayog. We work now with Niti Aayog and we are helping Niti Aayog set up what is going to be the first behavioral insights unit for the country. When Cass Sunstein and Richard Taylor wrote their very influential book, Nudge, it led to the creation of behavioral insights units all over the world. You know, UK was one of the first to adopt it, then the US adopted it. And you know, almost every country now has a behavioral insights unit. And the most conspicuous uh, countries which did not have a behavioral insights unit uh, were India and China. And now India is now creating that behavioral insights unit, and it's going to be the biggest behavioral insights unit in the world, given the size of the, uh, the, the population. So what are we going, to, what are we doing? So we're doing, we are, we are trying to solve some really, really tough problems uh, relating to health, relating to financial inclusion. Uh, we have this project on nudging, and within the domain of uh, health, we are working on uh, child and maternal health. We are working on uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, we, are, we are working on a slew of projects, right? 
Uh, take, for instance, the problem of anemia, which is highly prevalent among women, uh, pregnant women in India. So how do we get pregnant women to not miss taking their iron tablets? It might seem like a trivial problem, but it's a huge health problem. So now we need to think about why is it that these people forget taking their tablets or why do they dislike taking their tablets? We need to go and understand that and then create prototype interventions which will enable these people to remember taking those tablets. That's mm -hmm. one small example. Or for that matter, how do we get people to buy pension plans, right? It seems like a, you know, a, a trivial problem, but it's not a trivial problem. Getting people to protect themselves in the old age is a huge thing, right? And people, when they are young, don't want to think about when they are old because it makes them unhappy, right? And so there is a deliberate, rational ignorance of what might happen to you in bad times, and therefore you avoid that thinking in much the same way that people avoid thinking about uh, uh, them being potentially HIV patients and they avoid the HIV tests. So there's a form of rationally. So, so we have a slew of projects that we work. Exciting I mean, stuff. We study human behavior, irrational behavior, mad behavior, and try to address them. Absolutely. So, Pavan, uh, how do you how you know how do you see people uh, collaborating with with this center? Right? Uh, do you see entrepreneurs? What do you see entrepreneurs' role within the work that you guys are doing? Do they come after you've done your research? Do they come as a part of the research or before the research? How do they engage? They can they can just walk into our our, our place. Okay. Uh, we are located in Delhi, and uh, we believe that we are an extremely democratic. We pride ourselves for being a very flat and a democratic and an accessible uh, entity. Most of the organization is constituted of young and brilliant people, and. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, we, we, we thrive on great conversations. We serve reliably good coffee. So you can just walk in, right? You can walk in and you can have a conversation and, and tell us about the stuff that you do and say, hey, I mean, we have this problem. Is there a way we can think about finding a solution? What do you guys think of this? And in there, we, might act, we, we might turn around to you and say, you help us think through this problem. Okay. Right? Fair so fair yeah. Are there like workshops, learning programs? Are there like those, you know, internships or volunteering, those kind of opportunities with the center? Oh, absolutely. Or? absolutely. I mean, uh, we are trying to create uh, a, a, an internship program. Uh, if you have great ideas, you are motivated, you know, youngsters can come and say, listen, I want to help. In what way can I be of any help? Walk in. You know me. Right? Yeah. There's no other way that I would want it. You know my house in I am back. That's exactly what CSPC is going to be. It's going to be an open house where people can, from different walks of life, can come and engage in a conversation, try and find solutions to problems. Pavan, this has been an amazing one hour of you know our, our time with each other. And then obviously, I'm sorry, it's not just with me. I, so everybody who's obviously watching us, but I really get a lot, um, you know, by talking to you. And this is. This is not the first time and I, I crave for these kind of conversations with you. And thank you so much for taking time. If you want to sort of give your coordinates, call to action, anything that you want to sort of leave the audience with in the last few words, please. I'd be, I mean, please do share my email address to, uh, to the audience. And uh, I, in, in, in closing, all that I can say is uh, I don't have answers to all the questions. And uh, we are basically scientists, and we are willing to accept when our hypotheses have been falsified. Uh, you know, our, so yeah, so that's who we are. If you want to have an engaging conversation, feel free to drop by, drop in, and send me an email. I'm happy to return. Or, you know, give me a call if you're in Delhi. Let's have a cup of coffee. One thing that I would like to request you is, you know, uh, there is this concept of disruption, right? And more yeah. so in the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial culture where people are so busy trying to disrupt. And then they go out and try to build things. Certain times it works. A lot of times it doesn't work, mostly because, in my opinion, people don't understand the behavior behind what product they are building from a consumer behavior, basically, mm -hmm. which to a lot of waste of resources, a lot of impact to the society, impact to 
ecology and whatnot. Maybe if the center can sort of create some sort of an intervention or a capsule like a program of some sorts that can teach entrepreneurs about how to understand behavior before you go create a product could also help a lot of people from not creating a lot of shit and then, you know, trying and failing and burning money and so on and so forth, especially yeah. when we are in a country like India, which is resource crunched. Mm -hmm. So please consider if you can do something. Absolutely. And, let's do it. Let's, yeah? let, let's CSBC and Draper do it together. Absolutely. Let's cook, let's cook this together. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you so much, Pavan. Thank you, Shashi. Thanks for this great opportunity. Have a great weekend and love to hey, you. Too. You too. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 All right, guys, that was Pavan for us. And, um, you know, Ashish, if you can sort of bring up our, you know, last slide, I can walk people quickly through a few of the action points and the way they can sort of engage with us. Uh, Guys, Ripper Startup House is essentially about helping uh, entrepreneurs, uh, creative people, people who are in the society trying to do something, give them a platform, you know, enhance their work and, and accelerate uh, their paths to sort of success. And whatever that success is very self-defined, right? So uh, stay in touch with us. We've got multiple ways we sort of help entrepreneurs out. We run a, a co-living slash residency sort of a space in Bangalore. Um, you know, we run, uh, we have an academy which we put out a lot of these kinds of talks and programs and discussions for you people to learn from and engage on what's going on in the entrepreneurial world. Uh, you know, we talk about, uh, we have, a, you know, yeah, so we're backed by Tim Draper, so uh, the general investor who's sort of gone through um, a lot of great investments in his life and he's backing us and he's on board to help entrepreneurs become successful and have capital and as well as growth markets as, as efficiently as possible. Um, yeah, so we can move on to these slides. Uh, with the den slide, Ashish, you can just quickly bring up the den slide. Um, and yes, so this is something important and so it's something interesting that we've started recently. Uh, after COVID, obviously, we, everything is accelerated these days. Now we've sort of Try to create, uh, initially our spaces were designed for people to come in and meet us physically and stay with us and learn from each other. Um, so we were thinking about how do we create something uh, virtual? How do we create a similar experience for people to still come in as guests, but virtually? And then, uh, you know, we started doing something called as Den. It's a Den, it's a Draper Entrepreneur Network. We've got a, you know, beautiful Slack channel where people from all around the world, from our communities come and interact with each other. You can have access to sort of our venture syndicate where you can raise money from a lot of learning and networking opportunities so yeah so this is us uh, we will continue to sort of keep you know continue to do this to help and support and grow the ecosystem uh, in india and globally as well so uh, thanks for your time have a great weekend and hope to see you guys around my name is shashi and you can connect with me on linkedin too bye bye thank you everyone for joining have a good day